Hi everybody and welcome. In today's video, I want to share my personal strategy in dealing with AI problems that are non-objective. But first of all, we should ask what are objective problems in AI? Well, these are problems that we are used to work with all the time. And this is like the main topic for like artificial intelligence applications. So think, for example, of anomaly detection. So you build a, an anomaly detector and the idea is to understand or just like to realize whether a machine has a malfunction or it doesn't have it. Now, we don't need, uh, well, this is a kind of like objective thing in that either a machine has a malfunction or it doesn't have it. Now, another example is image classification. So you have a set of different pictures and you take a look at the pictures and then you say, okay, so in this picture, I have a dog. In this other picture, I have a cat. And in a third picture, I have a house. Now, it really doesn't depend that much on different observers because everyone, hopefully, is going to agree that you have a cat in that picture or a dog in that other picture. Now, the opposite to objective problems are like non-objective or subjective problems. I work in AI music, and if you follow this channel, you know that this channel is all about AI audio and AI music. Now, in AI music, there's plenty of subjective uh, problems. And these usually come in when you're dealing with like very high level descriptions or understanding of music, for example. So uh, imagine that we want to agree on certain genres or classify a piece of music and decide which genre that piece of music is in. Now, this is a subjective problem because sometimes we may agree, sometimes we may not. Same thing like with uh, emotion classification in music. I listen to, I don't know, some Beethoven uh, symphony and I feel anger and I feel rage, but you may feel, I feel a warmth or even, I don't know, happiness. There, there's like this level of subjectivity that comes in when we deal with certain problems. And this is because of our like backgrounds, the different upbringing and like the different like social and cultural understanding that each of us has and each of us puts into uh, a classification problem like this, like for example, like music genre or like emotion in music. Right. Okay. So now for like this video, I'm going to use music genre classification as, as an example that I'll use throughout uh, like all the steps that I'll uh, talk about for my personal strategy for dealing with like these types of problems. Okay. So let's get started with this strategy. So point number one is to set up the boundaries of a non-objective problem. So what do you mean by that? Well, first of all, you want to decide whether you're, you want to approach your problem as a regression task or a classification task. In the case of music genre classification, usually you um, approach that as a classification problem, right? So uh, you, you just decide like whether like you have a um, certain like, so whether like a piece of music is in a certain genre or is it not, but you can potentially also use a regression problem. So you could give like different scores, for example, to how much rocky a certain piece is or how much classical that is. Um, okay, but this is just like a first part. The second part, which I think is even more important with uh, subjective problems in AI, is to define a meaningful taxonomy. So by that, I mean, uh, you have to define a set of classes like that make sense. For example, uh, in a music genre uh, classification, so you want to come up with uh, a bunch of uh, genre descriptors that are meaningful. And here you have a choice. You can go like as granular as you want, really. So you can have, for example, like 10 um, genre descriptors, or you can have 50 or 100. But that is going to have a huge impact on the performance of your algorithm and also on the way human 
uh, evaluators or human uh, listeners or annotators can do on that specific problem. Let me explain what I mean here. So let's assume we only have 10 uh, genre descriptors. And these are like very broad genre descriptors like rock, classical, uh, jazz, folk. You get the idea, right? So now we, you and I listen to the same piece of music and it's going to be relatively easy for us to agree that a, that piece is in, I don't know, like jazz, but it's not in classical. Now, imagine you have 50 genre descriptors. So you have like a very granular taxonomy there. Now we, we listen to a piece of music that we both agree, like is it rock? But now right, we have a bunch of descriptors for rock as a subgenre, right? So we could have, for example, psychedelic rock and prog rock, progressive rock. So you may think that that piece is an example of psychedelic rock. For example, it could be Amagama from the, the Pink Floyd, that album. But uh, I may think that that piece is like prog rock, for example. And we may disagree there. In other words, depending on the taxonomy that we have, we may have like more or less uh, agreement. And usually what happens in non-objective problems is that the more granular the taxonomy that you have and the more disagreement you'll have among annotators or evaluators, let's call them like however we want, okay? So when you set up the boundaries for a non-objective problem, what you want to do is to set up in a way that you have a nice, balance between the complexity of representing like reality in a way that's meaningful and provides us with useful information and um, being like parsimonious enough to not like overwhelm the taxonomy with too much complexity which would basically make the the whole like endeavor that uh, like basically like impossible okay so this was like for setting up like the boundaries for a problem. Now, the second step in my strategy is to understand what humans can do. And what do I mean by that? Well, given we are dealing with uh, subjective problems, so we want to understand what's the maximum level of human performance. And that is going to be a ceiling for our algorithms. And that's because there's no way our algorithms are going to do better than humans can do. And why is that the case? Well, that's because in this type of problems, the ultimate judge isn't some kind of like external objective thing. It's just us, the human beings. So in music genre classification, there's no definition of, I mean, there's no point where you, objective way of saying, yeah, this piece of music is 100% psychedelic rock, but it's not progressive rock. That will always depend on our personal and subjective uh, judgment. So for that reason, we want to understand what's the level of agreement that we humans have regarding like a certain problem. And now this agreement, be aware, depends on the definition of the problem itself. Because as I said, it's one thing if we have like only like 10 descriptors for music genre, it's another thing if we have 100 music genre descriptors. Okay, so how do we measure this agreement? Well, first of all, we should define it and that's called inter-annotator agreement. And the second thing is we want to measure it. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by setting up an experiment where we give people, um, like for example, in the music genre classic music genre like problem, we give them um, a bunch of uh, pieces of music to listen to, and then they should annotate the genre that they want to uh, like annotate, right? Uh, okay. So once we have that information with enough uh, people on the same uh, like music set data set then we can use that information to run some like magic stats and then understand how much people agree among themselves. Now, for problems like music genre classification or like uh, emotion classification in music, 
usually you get some kind of agreement that's around 60 to 80 percent depending on the definition of the uh, problem so that we should keep in mind because it's our, it's our ceiling so we can do more than that there's no reason why we should optimize once we reach that level okay so now that we know the level of inter and notator agreement and in other words the human performance level the next step is to pick up a metric that we'll use to optimize our um, algorithms so what do you mean by that well we want to keep things as simple as possible and so for that we are going to choose one single metric that we'll use to decide on how good the different algorithms that we are training are doing okay so how do we pick that metric well this metric should first of all reflect the problem itself because it's one thing if i'm dealing with like music genre classification it's another thing if i'm dealing with like i don't know like emotion uh, classification in music right but most importantly we should take a look at broader picture at the use case uh, that we are tackling in other words we should think of how our algorithms are used by the end users in other words we should ask ourselves what are what is the main metric what is the main su success uh, metric that the end user is going to use to judge the quality of our algorithms okay so now this is difficult to achieve without like on um, i mean having data so picking like the right metric for that reason we need to guess at the beginning at the start of the project we may even have a chat with end users and understand their perspective on the problem if we are lucky enough to have like end users who know what the problem and use case is all about but then we need to come up with a metric in the case of music genre classification we could use simple like machine learning like mm, mm, success metrics and performance metrics or like information retrieval success uh, performance metrics so it could be like precision for example if we are interested in getting like only like the right correct genres for a certain piece of music or it could be recall for example if we are interested in getting as much um correct um genre descriptors as possible for a piece of music and we are not that really interested in accuracy or precision there or if we want to like balance out the two things like precision and recall we could use potentially the f score for example okay but now we have a metric so what do we do with that well we enter step three which is doing a quick round of uh training and so why do we want to do a quick round of training well we want it to be quick because we want to come up with models that we can then uh, use and evaluate with end users but for this step what we want to do is to try out a bunch of different network architectures or if we are using like other like techniques beyond deep learning like for example traditional machine learning we could try different algorithms support for the support vector machines logistic linear regression yeah you name it okay so you then come up with a bunch of these uh, models you choose the ones that you think perform best based on your metric and then the next step is to present the results to uh, users and go for a round of evaluation and what should we do here well in this round of evaluation what we want to do really is to provide the users with kind of like a test set and have like predictions for like different models that from different models that we think are the best that we've trained and provide all the predictions for the different models and ask users to uh, rate the quality of the predictions with the results we get from evaluation we can first of all understand which models are doing great and which are doing not that great but also we have some feedback on our metric and why is that the case well because we can get the ratings on the models and compare that against like our metric for all of the different models and understand whether our metric is capable of capturing the 
evaluator's way of evaluating stuff. Now, if it doesn't do that great, the metric itself, we can refine it so that we align it to the, um, the way like the evaluators have rated our models. Okay, so this is a way of refining our metric. Now, another thing that you want to do during evaluation is to also uh, include some dummy data. And by dummy data, I mean actual annotations by humans. And why would we do that? So we would basically um, hide the annotations of human beings under like a dummy model. And that's because we want to compare the quality of the predictions of our algorithms with the, uh, with the, with the ground truth, which is like the human annotations. And we would do that to understand uh, how far we, we are for the human performance uh, level, okay? Because if we are close enough, perhaps it's not worth to continue doing training, but if we are far enough, we know how far we are and how we're gonna do like, and we can like track how like much we are improving at every uh, evaluation round. Okay, so now we've done our evaluation, we've refined our uh, metric, it's time to go and move to step six, which is basically that of like spending more time on optimization and training. This time we can actually spend more time on this because we have a metric that's a more solid because we've tested it, we, we have some data to back it up. So it's worth spending more time on this. But remember, we are dealing with a highly, potentially a highly subjective problem. So you don't want to really over-engineer or over-optimize stuff because there's always that risk of getting to human performance level and then there's no reason why you should continue optimizing that because that's the ceiling. You can do better than humans on subjective problems. Okay, so once you're done with the optimization, what should you do? Well, you just go back all the way to evaluation and this is a loop that you'll start being in and you'll go through this loop as many times as you need to like optimize like, your algorithms and until like you feel your algorithm, algorithms are doing great. And this loop is basically this. So you train, you go back to evaluation, you refine the metric if needs be, and then you go back to training and optimization. Okay, so this is it for my strategy uh, regarding uh, dealing with um, non-objective problems in AI. So let me give you a quick wrap up or like summary of all of the different steps. So first thing that you wanna do is set up, define the problem and set up boundaries for the problem that may be meaningful. Once you have that, you want to move on and understand uh, how well humans can perform on the problem as you've defined it Third point is to uh, actually find a temporary metric that you can use to uh, decide on the models and optimize them. Fourth point is to start uh, training, uh, a quick round of training, and then use the best results to go to step five, which is a round of evaluation and a refinement of the metric. And in step six, you just go back and train more and optimize more. And here you can start a loop between step six and step five. So you optimize and you evaluate, you refine the metric and then you optimize again. Cool. So I hope this was like useful for you. If that's the case, please give a thumb up to this video. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do. And before I dash off, I want to talk about the Sound of AI community. I don't know like if you're already there, but if you're not, you should definitely check that out. It's a community that's on a Slack workspace and we use it like just to share ideas among people who are super interested in AI music, AI audio and AI um, and audio digital signal processing. So yeah, I suggest you just to just check that out if you haven't done so and I'll leave you the sign up link in the description below. It's all for today. I hope I'll see you next time. Cheers.